Christian gets put on a lot of different things. Christian dating apps, Christian businesses, all kinds of different churches. But what does it really mean to be a follower of Jesus? To be a follower of Jesus means that our sins have been forgiven. All of us have sinned. Romans 3.23 says, For we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, I know the enemy came in, you know. Um, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I started having demonic things happen in my life. Since I grew up in a, a household that had a very twisted view of who God was, um, at the time, I had no idea what to believe. I believe there was a God, but I felt like I just kind of knew my life better. You know, I knew myself better than he did. Being raised in a Christian home, I knew that there was eternity. And I struggled with that a lot when I was a small child, trying to grasp the reality of living forever, eternity. There is a path inside of each of us that seems right but the end thereof is the way of death. Now I've read that proverb, I know, a hundred times, but this time what resonated with me was, it says in each of us, there's a path that seems right, but the end of that path is death. I didn't know what hope was. I didn't, I didn't know, I thought you had to work to earn your salvation. Once I kind of started Definitely not living a Christian life and living in sin, I think a lot of it then just became shame. Like I just, like a lot of people I'm sure, but felt like I didn't deserve to be in a church, you know, and uh, didn't feel like people would accept me, you know, for the stuff that I had done. I was raised in a home that didn't talk about the Lord. I didn't know the Lord. A couple of times my dad took us to the Episcopalian Church um, on Christmas, you know, the Christmas and Easter kind of thing. And um, I do remember when I went there, even as a little child, I, f I felt something there and I really liked it. I didn't know what it was. I felt drawn to it. And now I know it was the Holy Spirit. One of the first questions she asked me was, do you know Jesus? And here I am, 15 year old boy, you know, just kind of living his life and not really having any structure of religion or faith. I told her no, and, she, and I remember her clearly saying, this is not going to work. And I thought to myself, oh, I can't let this girl slide away here. So I said, well, if Jesus is so important to you, talk to me about him. Let me get to, you know, teach me, tell me about him. I tell people that I'm the biggest argument against natural selection because I should have died hundreds of times from the stupid things that I did. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. It'll certainly enhance your walk with the Lord once you are a Christian, and it's a good place to become a Christian. But once you ask the Lord in your heart, the Holy Spirit comes to empower you to change directions from the way you were living. Growing up in church, you know, you're sheltered. Like for me, I have to speak for myself, I was sheltered. And, and seeing the way that he lived his life, it was um, so different. The major misconception for me before becoming a Christian, I think it was the legalistic part. I know I personally will um, make it too hard on myself. I grew up in a home that was a Christian home. My grandma always taught everybody about Jesus, not necessarily in some high theology sense, but she taught us that Jesus loves us and He is God. I would say I would ch was challenged later on by could I answer tough questions about my faith? And that's kind of where I became more intentional and serious. When I was 16, my mom, she went through a hard time. My parents got divorced when I was 13. And um, so she was, she was having a tough time. So she started having a Bible study in our home. And I went in there one night, I was partying with my friends and I came in and they were all sitting there and they said, um, can we pray for you? And I was like, okay, you know, and they laid hands on me and they started reading my mail and they started saying, you are hanging out with people that you shouldn't be with. And they were, they were just, and I thought, man, you're saying all this in front of my mom. I think my first 
overdose was either 12 or 13 years of age. I was uh, freebasing cocaine. I was doing every pill known to man except for birth control. And anything I could get my hands on, PCP, you name it all, I was doing acid, mushrooms, mesculine, you know, the microdots, the, the opium, everything I could get my hands on, even as a young adolescent. One man laid his hands on my head and I felt a fireball go through my body of heat. And he said, do you feel that? And I said, yeah, I, I didn't know what it was, but it was powerful. God touched me, um, but I actually got worse after that. Kind of like wearing a mask over myself and just think that everything is okay. I don't really show, you know, any other emotions, you know, I, I behave in a way, um, and then kind of not speaking my mind or showing opinion because I didn't know if people would like me. So I just hid and did like a invisible mask. No matter how many steps away from Christ you have taken, it only takes one step back to that cross and he's waiting there with the gift of forgiveness and grace. I started having demonic things happen in my life. When I would start going to sleep at night, I would, f I would sleep with my arms like this. I could feel somebody holding my arms and, and, I, and I broke out of it. And then the next night I went to bed and I could feel someone holding my arms again. And I was like, what is going on? And then the third night it happened and I felt someone holding me and I, and I could not break away from it. And then I audibly heard a demon call my name audibly in my bedroom, Leslie. And I screamed for my mom, but nothing came out. And finally I got, got it out, mom. And she came running, my little 85 pound mother, skinny little thing. I just grabbed onto her and held on tight. And um, so the devil was messing with me. I remember into our relationship, we were probably maybe a few years into it, and she started going back to church, started getting her life right with God, her mother as well. And she came up to me one day and she says, this relationship is not gonna work. She's like, I'm just tired of it. She goes, you haven't asked me to marry you. You don't serve God. She goes, this is it, I'm, I'm out of here. I knew I was going down a dead end road and I wanted to change inside. The drive was really, I wanted to, I wanted to grow up. I wanted to be a man. I wanted to make something of myself in spite of having dropped out of high school. And I thought, well, the best thing I can do is join the Navy. And the Navy would discipline me. And the Navy would help me learn a, a trade and I would have a career and I would have a retirement and I would see the world. That was my idea. And I thought at the same time, I'll get away from all the drug heads. She goes, you're either gonna marry me and you're gonna serve my God. And she said it just like that. And I was like, yeah, this is, she's just upset. I, I'm gonna let this blow over. Well, one week turned to a month, a month turned to a year almost where we were living like roommates. Like we just like, like friends, we hung out every now and then, but she, had, she didn't want anything with me romantically or anything. And, I realized like, she is being serious about this. Like the Lord is that important to her in her life and she's not willing to compromise that. So I thought, well, I mean, I don't want to follow Jesus, but I, I want to be with her. So I remember proposing to her and uh, she said, yeah, <laughs> uh, unequally yoked, but she said, yeah, but the Lord knew what he was doing in that process. So my upbringing was very much a melting pot. Um, I had my mom that was a Jehovah's Witness. So I was kind of raised in that during the week and then, um, during the weekend, my grandpa would take me to a Methodist church and then my, my stepdad was a Catholic. So I was just thrown into this big melting pot. I always knew there was a God, but had absolutely no truth in anything. The only real religion, I guess, or Christianity I knew about was like a little Southern Baptist and like Catholic or Catholicism. And I just felt like there's so many just rules, almost like you had to one kind of already be perfect, you know, when you came to Christ. Went to college, I was a party girl. Um, I had a problem with alcohol and I could not 
quit. Like every Friday night I would be partying and I would wake up Saturday and go, gotta stop this, but I never could. Not on my own strength. Back to when she finally had that encounter with God and she began to go back to church, um, her mom was having life groups in her house. And I remember her constantly asking me, you should come to these life groups. And I'm like, oh, I got no time for that. Like, I'm trying to watch a game. First day I reported aboard the ship I was on. And someone come up to me and said, hey man, you get high? And I started off that very first day reporting to duty, getting into the wrong crowd. And it didn't take too long, six months in the service before I was busted for drugs and alcohol, standing captain's mast, and my career was being shot. So I used to have a Bible on my desk in college my mom gave me, and I would pull that thing out and open it up, and I'd try to read it, and I would be like, this makes no sense at all, and i go, wham, i just shut it. And I went to this life group, and I'm listening to the pastor, he's sharing his testimony and how God changed his life. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no way this dude is a pastor from what he is saying, like, because you have this vision of a pastor being this uh, holier than thou kind of uh, beyond approach kind of guy. But yeah, this man seemed like he was so normal. He seemed like somebody I would have hung out with in the streets before Jesus. I was just a five-year-old boy. When I gave my life to Jesus, slept through a revival meeting, woke up in time for the altar call, saw the evangelist paint Calvary, and I realized he did it for me. I began to weep. And my mom said, son, we'll get you home soon enough. We'll get you to bed. She thought I was crying because I was ready to go to bed and I couldn't be consoled. And finally she said, what's the matter? And I said through my tears, he did it for me. And I went up and gave my life to the Lord. I was able to visit that church 50 years later and go to that same place I kneeled, knelt at as a five-year-old boy. And at that altar at five years old, Jesus saved me. And even at five, I felt the weight of sin come off my shoulder. And I would not leave until I hugged everybody's neck in that church. I was so full of the love of God. I can remember having so much joy. And after I gave my life to Christ, I knew like I had to go and like tell people like <laughs> what happened and like just joy and just happiness. And then I think everything else kind of followed after it. The only truth that I did have, I should say, was going to the Methodist church with my, with my grandparents and how my grandpa just prayed and prayed that I would accept Jesus. And so I finally did um, in 2006 when I was about 15 years old. And it was such a powerful moment because um, believing as a Jehovah's Witness for such a long time and being kind of indoctrinated with that, they didn't believe that Jesus was God. So when I finally had the aha moment that the Trinity made sense, it was it made absolutely no sense how I came to the conclusion or anything. It was just like the Holy Spirit just reached down and said, get it. <laughs> and I did. And it was such an amazing, um, it was just such an amazing moment in my life. And I couldn't not, I had to tell everybody about it. They were having a Bible study at the church Thursday night. And I remember telling them, yeah, I'll show up, I'll go not thinking, I just want to be polite. And she reminded me on Thursday morning, you told him you were coming to the church for, for Bible study. And I said, come on, she's like, you're a man of your word, you're coming. And I went, and so uncomfortable walking into this building, because, you know, I'm a sinner, I'm uh, walking into a church, you know, you're hoping that the place doesn't burn down. Um, and I'm standing in the back, and uh, he's preaching, and this guy's sweating, he's going in, giving the word, and I'm looking at the drapes, I'm looking at the carpet, and then at one moment, it was just like all of a sudden I had this tunnel vision. Didn't know what he was saying, but I was, in, I was locked into him just really passionately speaking of God. And it was like all of a sudden I felt this weight, like a heaviness, like I was carrying something that it was beyond what I can hold. And my knees, everything was shaking. I just felt like overtaken with this emotion that I started crying and I'm not an emotional person. And, um, I remember at the end of service, I'm trying to compose myself and he had done an altar call and I remember running up to the front of that altar, tears in my eyes, just saying, I want to get saved. And I remember just crying out to Jesus to, to forgive me and to save me. At that moment, I realized 
the weight of my sin is what I was holding and, and it was heavy. And God wanted to take that burden from me, but he needed me to give it to him. And so when I ran and I gave it to him, the moment I cried out and I asked him to forgive me and come into my life, it was as if the weight was taken away and he took that burden from me, as the scriptures say. When the Holy Spirit comes, it changes everything. Salvation does not only just save us, but it empowers us. It's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that allows me to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. God empowers us to live a godly life. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, 9, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I graduated from college. I had a good job and my car broke down beyond repair. And I had to just leave this good job I had and move to Florida to be with my mom. And so that's when my life began to shift. There was something in me that start a hunger that was starting to build. I remember I said, I got to get out of this Navy. I put in a request shit submitted it to my chief. And he laughed at me. He says, you can't request out of the Navy. I said, chief, would you just submit it up the chain? One week later, I was out of the Navy. And I took a general discharge. I got out of the Navy. And I thought, OK, this is it. I can start my life anew. I can start over, clean. I started asking the questions, what's this life about? Where am I going? Where did I come from? And what's my part in this world? And I thought, well, you know what? I should go to church. And I was just a few months out of the Navy when I had already got back into the same old habits. I had already drank a fifth of vodka and orange juice and a six pack of beer before noontime and I was driving around in Auburn. I was coming back home and I had a car accident and I ran into a police car and totaled out the police car, totaled out the car I was in, which wasn't mine, it was my mother's car, and God got me out of that. And that's when the light went off.
To follow Jesus is the first recognition that I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I need someone to fix me. I need forgiveness. That's where repentance starts with an acknowledgement that I'm in the wrong and I need a savior. I had an encounter with God. A per he had me on the floor for five hours, five hours dealing with heart issues, heart issues um, and deliverance, really delivering me. Um, because I had so much unforgiveness. Life should have went off a long time ago with the drugs, but it didn't. But it did go off when I started seeing my friends left and right going to prison for quaaludes. God was just preserving me throughout. And, um, and that was the turnaround. That was the turnaround that uh, led me back to God. I just wandered into a church and I heard a message for the first time that really touched my heart. And he said, if you want to accept Christ, come forward. And it was so far because I was sitting, sitting toward the back and I thought, I'll come back at night tonight and I'll sit near the front of the, you know, toward that altar. And whenever he says that to come forward, then I'll do it because I was too shy to walk in front of everybody. And this is the, the goodness of God. Because he told me, he said, listen, he told me a lot of things that day. Number one, you think you're going to heaven, but you're not. Because there's so much hate in your heart. Number two, this is, this is not, the way you're living, this is not what I intended for your life. And absolutely, I knew what he was talking about. So I went back that night and I sat really close to the front. And I have no idea what the man preached, but I just waited to hear him say, if you want to accept Christ, come forward. And he said it, thank the Lord. And I went forward and I prayed that prayer. And I felt the weight of sin come off on my shoulder. It was tangible. And um, I always love the story at Christmas Carol because I feel like I was just like Jacob Marley. He came through that door with all the chains, sorry, all the chains and all the weight of that sin. And it just, I lifted, the Lord just snapped him off of me. It just lifted off. And my life was never the same after that. God's plan for every one of his children is to be with him one day, but sin separates us from God. His desire though, is that we're not separate, just like a parent that loves their children, they don't want to be separated. They want to be with their kids. And our Abba Father, our Daddy God, He wants to be with us. And so while we were yet sinners, God sent His Son to redeem us so that we could get back into the family. After that DUI with the cop car, that my father here in, in Pensacola called me. And um, I hadn't seen him for many years. And he called me, he said, son, he said, would you like to come to Pensacola? And uh, he knew I'd gotten out of the military, knew that I'd dropped out of high school. He probably knew everything about me that I didn't know he knew. And he says, you can come down here and I'll help you through school. We'll get your GED. I'll send you to college. You can have my business one day if you want it. And that was my new start. I remember going to an, uh, it was just a bedroom that was his office. And I remember going into that office by myself on that 1970s green shag carpet and kneeling down, still very much addicted to drugs, even though I was going to church even though I was living the outward appearance that I was a Christian, I wasn't. And I remember getting on my knees and I prayed and I, just a simple prayer said, God, I want to serve you, but I can't break this addiction of drugs. And I said, God, if you'll take away the desire I'll give you my life and I'll serve you. 
And for the first time in probably 12 years at that point, I got up off my knees and never had a desire for drugs. Never. It was gone. I was healed of it. Romans 6, 4 says, For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. This is referring to the next step. Now that you've accepted the Lord in your heart, you've acknowledged you're a sinner, you've asked for his forgiveness, and by grace you've been saved, then the next step is for water baptism. And that water baptism, as described here in Romans 6, 4, that baptistry, the water you go down into, if it's the beach, the river, or the baptistry at church, it represents a watery grave. So you go into that water, the old person, and you are buried in that water. But just like Christ was raised from the dead and came out of that grave, And you come out of that water with an open confession of your faith. I got baptized into the Christian church um, after I had had my my aha moment that, oh, the Trinity is, it's legit. Like, I understand this and it opened up so much more. I had to tell everybody about it. I had to tell, I called my grandma, I was like, I got baptized. She's like, you got baptized? I was like, yeah, I did. She's like, well, I would have liked to have been there, but (laughs) at the time I just accepted Jesus and I was ready to go and I was all in. And all the old is passed away and all things become new. You are as innocent as a little one year old child when you ask the Lord to forgive you. It's justification by faith. Justification simply means just as if it never happened. It's all a part of God's plan, man. He had to come down and be that perfect sacrifice for our sins, you know, to fulfill God's plan. You know, no no human person was capable of being that perfect sacrifice. You know, he came to set us free of our sins and to make us white as snow. And when you understand what that means, um, my wife and I have two be- two beautiful boys and to think of being able to do that, to, to sacrifice your only son just for the sake of others so that they have freedom. I mean, when you truly understand that, that just changes everything. There's all kinds of beliefs out there under the name of Christian. And one will tell you something exactly the opposite of of somebody else. The reality is we have got to embrace the Word of God and all the Word of God. That's what it means to follow Jesus. It means that you take His Word as the absolute anchor of your soul and what you're going to dictate your life by. It is going to become the measuring tape of your life. And you're going to take that and put it in your heart. If God exists, how did he interact within the world? And however you go about that route, you're gonna get to some point of having to deal with the Bible. So if God's real, you have to take the Bible and figure it out. I would say that God has revealed himself to mankind through the person of Jesus Christ. But before that, he revealed himself through a burning bush through the parting of the Red Sea, through creation. God has constantly uh, revealed himself to mankind. And along the way, he has spoken to man and he has inspired them to write their encounters and their stories that they've had with God and it's been given to us and passed down. What I love about the Bible is that history completely backs it up. I mean, in Israel, they're still finding things every week, practically, that back up the Bible. The money that they used, in, that they talk about in the Bible is has been found, and the cultures that they talked about have all been found. Everything is backed up with reality and history and truth. This interaction with God 
and his people with events such as the Exodus, with events such as the Babylonian exile, the Roman occupation, the uh, following of Christ's ascension and the interaction that followed. There are historical events which has tied it um, to reality. So once you start looking at that historical aspect, you start understanding a relational aspect, God relating to his people. How can you follow Jesus? How can you follow anybody if you don't even know what he teaches? You have to know what he teaches. Not only that, the Bible is a living book. It is the primary source of truth for our lives. The Bible is a book of who God is, a revelation of, of his nature and his love for us as mankind. When you start reading your Bible, it starts to convict you very quickly. You're like, you know what, I gotta live better. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get that out of my life. Reading the Bible is the biggest accountability. God loves us so much that he gives us his word and tells us, it's, it's not rules, it's like, you know, you, we have free will. And he gives us his word and tells us, don't do this, because if you do this, you're gonna get hurt. There is a little bit of a cooperation between God and people because he permits us in some way to act as uh, moral agents. So over time, you see this constant redemption cycle of God trying to redeem his people. And so why is it not just truths and laws and rules? because God is trying to interact with his people and show love and try to get us back to Eden to be in that full communion with God. We get renewed, our spirits are saved, we're washed, we're cleansed, but we still got a mind that has to be transformed and renewed by the Word of God. My life was heading down a path and he came in and interfered and said, uh-uh, this path is not for you, I have another way. But along that way, there's going to be some things you're going to have to get rid of if you're going to follow me. And it was a non-negotiable. It wasn't like I had to negotiate with God. It, I just knew that these things weren't beneficial to me. I went to the bar that next Friday like I always did. And I, because um, I didn't know any better. I'm just living my life. And I went in there and the dance floor, they had the smoke machines going and everybody was out there dancing. And I looked out there and I thought, man, that looks like hell. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you do not belong in here anymore. In Romans chapter 12, 2, it says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect. I can't talk like I used to talk. I can't walk like I used to walk. I can't dress like I used to dress. I can't um, get into those conversations that I used to get into and gossip and do all of that. There has to be a transformation because we are a new creation in Christ Jesus, those that, that belong to Him. So they have to see that the old person has died. There's, there, that person is no longer. We are a new creation. So you don't have to tell people that I'm saved. I don't have to tell people that, you know, I, I raised my hand or I had an encounter with the Lord. No, my, the way that I move should tell someone that there's something different. Even if they don't even know Jesus, they should be able to say there's something different about that person. I began to just listen to the Holy Spirit in my life. And the Lord said, you need to pour out your alcohol. I didn't know that you could pray a prayer and say, Lord, take alcohol away from me because I, 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 I'm, I'm in this fight. But um, the Lord in His goodness, He took it away from me. But as long as I would cooperate with the Holy Spirit, then He would work in my life. And He said, pour it out. I had just gotten a big new bottle of alcohol. And I said, oh Lord. And I took that thing and poured it down the sink. And I said, okay, Father, I'll do what you say. And man, He took it away. And I never had a desire for alcohol again. And that was supernatural because trust me, I could not quit. The genuine part is so crucial. It can't be fate, it can't be, I'm a Christian now. Yeah, it has to be, 
a genuine transformation of yourself which takes place by integrating God into your life. When the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to start turning away and turning around from things you used to do. If you truly were born again, some of you are already felt your friends begin to separate from you. And maybe you, you're pondering, why is that happening? I'm not even, I don't even want that to happen. I want them to find Jesus too. I don't want them to separate. Well, the darkness and the light don't mix. And darkness hates the light. The deeds done in darkness. The evil want to do their deeds in darkness and you're like a, a glow worm when you come around. And there's no place to hide. And so they begin to separate. And they begin to think it's strange, the scripture says, that you don't live the way you used to live. Just be prepared for a lot of pushback, that's for sure. You're gonna get a lot of pushback because they know who you were before Christ. And they're gonna to wanna to see you back either in that character or they're gonna wait for you to stumble and make a mistake. And just know that you're not perfect because you know Jesus, but you are redeemed, you are forgiven. There is a growth process. We're not all birth from birth to adult. We're birth into babes. And that's what we really have to realize is that any of us that come to Christ, it doesn't matter what our knowledge, what our background is, we're still babes in Christ because we still have to learn how to apply this walk. You can be raised in a Christian home and you can know all the right things. You can know the Bible in and out and you can quote the scripture, but where the rubber meets the road is when you start applying those scriptures to your daily walk and how you walk out the struggles and the tough times in your life. That's really what's going to put the growth into your walk with God is you're going to hit those areas where you're going to feel like God's nowhere around. God wants to speak to you. Everybody hearing this, God wants to speak to you. He desperately wants to speak to you. He wants to have a conversation with you. A lot of people think of prayer as just me giving my list to God. But it's so important to listen to what God is saying. Yes, He is speaking. No matter who scoffs and who thinks that's crazy that you're hearing voices, Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. That's how we follow him, by listening to his voice. The devil is an opportunist. He plays off of trauma. About two, three years ago, when I went into just a really bad, dark spot, um, realizing that I really needed the Lord. Early on, nine months into my, my faith walk, uh, church leader, I would say a church father to me, um, had a situation where he acted out of character for a man of God. From an emotional standpoint, um, whenever you go through suffering, it is one of those times that you can either run away from God or you can run to God. And he meets us in that suffering. I was wearing a mask and thinking, oh, you know, this is not myself. You know, I'm just, because I was worried that people would think of me differently and everything. And then also um, realizing I need my medicine. I, it was a perspective change that I was like to function. So I thankful that the Lord took me to a really dark place. When I try to approach him biblically speaking, as we should approach one another when a brother offends us, uh, his response to me was very harsh and it wasn't Christ-like. And I remember as, as being a new Christian, I was like taken aback. And I told him, I said, I needed some time from the church just to kind of process this. And his response is, you know what, don't come back to the church. And I was like taken aback because I'm nine months into my walk and he's telling me this and I'm facing this crossroad once again. And I'm like, what do I do now? I, I believe God's real, but now I'm being told I can't come back to the church. You go through difficulties in life. You go through traumatic events in life. You go through things that are devastating in your life that emotionally set you in a topsy-turvy environment. And then he comes in and offers a solution of escape 
to the reality of the hurt and the pain and the things you're going through. At that moment, I could have easily gone back to a life that I was living, but I remember it. The Lord did something in my life, and I remember running after God and finding another place. But then later on in life, you know, finding myself now, if not being careful to also operate in my flesh. And that's why it's important that um, we know that there's going to be times where things are going to get under our skin. Things are going to happen rather than responding in my flesh. I'm going to take a time to say, Lord, what are you doing here? None of us, regardless of our upbringing, Christian environment, Christian upbringing, we are all susceptible to the attacks of the enemy. And like I said, he's an opportunist. And things happen to all of us. Well, there has been a, a lot of times where several occasions that we have suffered. Um, one of them was when we lost our son and had several miscarriages. And the Lord just carried us. When we went through immense heartbreak losing our daughter, and then four months later, losing another baby, even though I don't understand his will, and I don't understand everything, he sees so much further than I could ever see. And so I just learned to trust him. I say, you know what, God? I don't understand why this is happening. I don't understand, but I'm going to trust you anyway. He saw me, you know, in the deepest, pain, you know, because you, you just go through so much pain. Anyone that has lost a child or had miscarriages, you know, you, you go to, it's like, a, it's a darkness. And I don't know how people can get out of it if it's not without Jesus. He shames every idol.
whatever it is that you're going through even right now, like God has you and he loves us. Because I think one, when we're going through something, if it's a great loss, if it's your career, if it's a relationship, uh, most of the time when we're younger, it's like the end of the world. God can meet you where you are and you don't have to have the answers for why you're at where you're at, but you can still place your faith and trust in Him. This is life. This is part of the fallen world that we live in. Um, and it's just, it's tough. I don't want to believe in Christianity because it makes me feel good or it's good for my family or it gives us a community to go to. I want to believe it because it's true. If Christianity is not true, then we're fools. If Christianity is true, then it means everything. So whatever suffering I endure, I know I can get through the suffering because I know what the truth is. Well, one of my favorite quotes is Corey Ten Boom, and she said, though the pit is deep, your hand is still deeper, Lord. So I would just say, first of all, you're not alone. Lean into the Lord. He's a, he sticks closer than a brother, he said, and he's, he's there with you, even if you're feeling alone. I've learned to look back and say, you know what, I failed God here but he picked me right back up. And as long as I trusted him and committed to continue in my walk of faith and growth, he kept working with me. First Corinthians 12, 12 says the human parts, the human body rather has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. When you're with other believers, there's power in that. He said, if two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm in the midst. The Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. You need those relationships in your life. So even if you're shy or if it's difficult for you to talk to people, push yourself so that you can get in some relationships because that is what's going to keep you going. You know, nobody can be an island to themselves. It's not going to work. You're going to get cold. You're going to get lonely, isolated. And that's what the devil wants to do, is isolate you. We are members of one body, the body of Christ. And we need to be connected to the body of Christ. If my arm is severed from my body, it's going to decay quickly. It's got to be reattached quickly because if not, it's too late. We're all imperfect people, we're all broken. And I think it's when we recognize that in a state of humility, I, I can't do this alone, I'm a part of a body and I can't just do whatever I want within this body. We need to work together. Find some good people that are not religious, but they're good Christian people that are full of the love of God. They're kind-hearted, they're healthy, and they are. their eyes are they're talking about Jesus. They're not talking about themselves. They're not lifting themselves up, but they're lifting up the Lord. Religion is just bylaws without God. Trying to jump through the hoops and live in a life that we interpret as Christianity. That's religion. It's empty. It's lifeless. It has nothing of appeal. True Christianity is a very vibrant, full of life, newness, joy, happiness, knowing that no matter what I face day to day, God's got my back. Man, find people who are further along in their journey, glean from them all that you can, and really ask the Lord in prayer and fasting what it is that He has for you and develop that gift. You know, when I was younger, every decision I made was what's gonna benefit me, but after I became a Christian, I realize it's it's about the other people you know it's about pointing them to Jesus when we pray serve or help others in their faith we are following God's will and showing our gratitude for who he is you want to show gratitude to the Lord and worship him serve somebody else people walking around out here in life they're zombies they're dead men walking they don't know and they're looking for happiness, they're looking for joy, and they're looking for it in alcohol and in drugs and in sex and everything else, and, they, and education and a good job. They're trying to find their identity in temporal things. I said it earlier, we're all God's children. Some people are so lost and they don't recognize it. They're not serving Him. 
But when I do something kind for anybody, the homeless to the rich, it doesn't matter. When I serve somebody else, it's a way of me, it's a way of my worship back to God because I am serving his children. We're working for something so much bigger than ourselves and for something that we know is true because God's word never changes and we're fighting for his kingdom and there's nothing better we can do with our lives than that. And a Christian's life cannot be explained outside of experience. You have to experience it. And when you do, words can't describe it. There's better things ahead for that person who turns their life over to God. It doesn't matter how many years you got left on your pie chart. And when you come to the reality that you're not a temporal being, you're a eternal being, and you're gonna spend eternity somewhere and what you do today determines where that eternity is going to be, then it becomes a pursuit I want to follow. I want to pursue God as much as He pursued me.